may not know, uh, what Jaden does when he goes up there is he hits record for the audio and he hits start for a live broadcast. That way the people uh, that aren't able to be here in person can listen to the sermon later on online. And if I talk a little fast, like I tend to do, you can go listen to it again and hit pause and play and pause and play and make me last for a couple hours and figure out all those verses that I flew by you know, real quick. So uh, Today's lesson is going to be a little bit more simple than that, I hope, because today we're going to talk about a theme that is behind a lot of passages in the Bible. And once you realize that this theme is there, then a lot of passages that seemed a little bit strange and you wonder, why did Paul uh, say this in this place? Or why, why did Matthew quote this passage in this place? Will become a lot clearer. But before we talk about this, we need to have just a short history of God's people Israel. And I'm just going to run through uh, the history of God's people to get this setting in your mind as we go and look at some of these passages. If you recall, about 2,000 years before Jesus... There was a man picked by God to be the father of all, in a sense. And that man's name was Abraham. And Abraham and his sons uh, traveled to the land of Canaan. And there they camped for some number of years. And Abraham was was promised Abraham by God that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we find out later that it would be through Isaac that the seed would be called, and specifically... Uh, Isaac's children through the tribes of Israel, named after Jacob's sons. And so you have the 12 tribes of Israel. It come, it come to find out, though, uh, after a while staying in Canaan, there came a time of famine. And so they traveled to the land of Egypt, and there they stayed for about 400 years. After a period of 400 years in Egypt, there rose up a king that did not know about this uh, mutual uh, beneficial relationship between the Egyptians and the Israelites, And unlike the previous Egyptian kings, he enslaved the people of Israel and treated them very badly within that land of Egypt. And so a man sent from God by the name of Moses uh, came, and and he would lead his people out of the land of Egypt. Now, an interesting thing about Moses is that uh, the king during that day, in order to put pressure on the people of Israel and keep them from possibly raising an army in revolt against that kingdom in uh, in years to come, he had this uh, rule that all of the young men that were born into the nation, two years old and younger, would be put to death upon their birth. And uh, Moses' mother obviously did not want to go through with that, so she hid Moses among the reeds in the river and in the waters. And whenever the uh, daughter of the Pharaoh came to wash, she saved Noah out of that uh, bad situation and raised him as his own. Forty years later, Instead of participating in the wealth of the Egyptian kingdom, he would rather suffer the afflictions of Christ, as the Hebrews writer tells us, and he was willing to be among his people. But they rejected him, uh, in a sense, and was going to turn him over to the Egyptians for an act that he committed. And you can read all about that in the book of Egypt. But this is the man that God selected to lead his people out of the land of Egypt on the Exodus. Now, after some time... They get into their land of Israel, and they reject God as their king, and they set up their own king over them, and Saul was selected. And then David was selected after Saul. And David wanted to build a temple for God, but he wasn't allowed to because he was a man who shed a lot of blood. And so David's son Solomon is going to build the temple, and he did. But Solomon started a trend in Israel's history that was followed by virtually every king that, that followed after him, save one or two here and there. And that was the tradition of, unfortunately, marrying wives outside of the land of Israel, something that God told them not to do. Now, the reason why that was so bad is because the wives that came into the land of Israel to marry these kings brought with them the idols and the false gods of their particular nations. And so this led the people into idolatry. After some time of this going on, in the 7th century B.C., you have uh, this nation called Assyria that goes and takes the ten northern tribes into captivity. The tensions had gotten so strong in between the nations, uh, in between the tribes of Israel, that they split into two kingdoms. And the northern ten kingdoms were taken into captivity in Assyria. About 150 years later or so, even less than that, 
Judah followed suit and was carried into captivity by Babylon. However, before both of these nations were carried into captivity, they were given a promise. And that promise was this. If you would go with me to Isaiah chapter 11. The promise was that there would one day be an exodus that would be like that time that they came out of the land of Egypt. Look at Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 11 and following. Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 11 through 13. He says this, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, and Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up for us a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah and Judah will not harass Ephraim. In other words, the tensions between that northern kingdom and the southern kingdom would be resolved. Not only that, they'd be gathered back again. There would be a second exodus, a new exodus. And this exodus would take place this time, uh, not under uh, Moses, but under a descendant of David. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10. That's exactly what he says. Isaiah 11 and verse 10, he says, In that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand for a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. Uh, Jesse, of course, was the, king, was the uh, father of David. And so this is a descendant of David that would rule these people and lead them back out of this, uh, out of this dispersion in this thing that they call the second exodus or uh, the exodus for the new covenant. Now here's the thing about this is that after the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom was led in the captivity, well, the southern kingdom was allowed to come back in order that God would fulfill his promises to them by, by raising up this uh, this Messiah figure, this Christ, or this descendant of David. But even though they returned, they did not return in the same way that uh, the new exodus or the second exodus described. The temple that they rebuilt was nothing in compared to the temple that was built by the hands of Solomon. The power that they received wasn't even near what they had before their carrying away into these nations. And even during the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and even the prophets following uh, these, this return from Babylon, there was still an expectation that that exodus was still in their future. It had not yet been achieved. They were still waiting on this root of Jesse, on this seed of David to raise up and to finally fulfill the promises that God made to Abraham that truly all the nations of the earth would be blessed and that peace and full fellowship with God would be restored. This hope of this second exodus is a theme that, again, is behind many, many passages in the New Testament. We talked a little, about, a little bit about that uh, just a moment ago. But let me show you a great example of this. If you recall in the first uh, chapter of the... Um, of, well, not the first chapter, but the first section of every gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is a figure that pops up named John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is described in this way. Open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. This is the description of John the Baptist. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Now this passage again is referenced in every gospel account. Now I want you to, well, before we read it, think about the significance of that. Think about the major events that are depicted in the gospel accounts. And are depicted in every single one. Jesus' crucifixion is depicted in every single one. But besides that, you're going to be hard-pressed to find an account that's found in every single gospel account. All right? But this verse is quoted in every single gospel account. Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. In the wilderness. That's, that's, a, that's supposed to take your mind back to the time of the Exodus. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become 
a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Notice what happens down here in verse uh, in verse nine. Get up, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. By the way, the word gospel in the New Testament means good news. All right. Lift, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might and with his arm ruling for him. And behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Now, this picture that he's giving here, again, is a picture of the Exodus. It's a picture of the restoration of the power to, to God's people. This promise that they expected, would they would know that it was at the doors whenever this figure, this voice calling in the wilderness would come about. Now, if you like to take notes, I'll give you every reference here for you. Uh, this Isaiah 40 passage particularly verse 3, is referenced in the following passages. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3 is one. That's in the book of Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. The second one is in Mark chapter 1 and verse 3. So Matthew 3, 3, Mark 1, 3. And then Luke chapter 3 verses 4 through 6. Luke chapter 3 verses 4 through 6. And then finally, uh, John chapter 1 and verse 23. And I can give you those again after Bible class if you need them. John chapter 1 verse 23. Matthew 3, 3, Mark 1, 3, Luke 3, 4 through 6, and John 1, 23. Those are the passages that reference this Isaiah 40 verse 3 passage. Every gospel account, that gives you an idea of how important that was. But it also tells you that this theme of the second exodus was something that was on the minds of that was on the mind of John as he began his ministry. It was on the minds of the people. It's how the gospel starts out. So this, uh, again, this theme is vitally important for our understanding of the New Testament. Let me show you how important it is. Go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to read here verses 1 through 11, just to give you this idea. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verses 1 through 11. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. That's referencing the passing through the Red Sea that takes place in the Exodus. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, so most... With most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these happened as an example for us, so that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents." nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them, and your Bible probably says as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now that word example might not be the best word, because the uh, Greek word behind this is tupos, which means a type. So this isn't just an example to go by, but this means that the event in the and the Exodus were a foreshadowing, and we could even say it was a uh, it was do what a mirror, right, of what was taking place in the first century. I was going to say a sort of a dress rehearsal, in a sense, of what happens in the first century. All right. Now that means there's parallels between what took place in the Exodus and what takes place in the time of the uh, the first century. Again, notice when he says, "Now these things happen to them as an example or as a type." And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. You might be tempted to say, oh, they're written for my instruction, and the end of the ages have come upon me. But if you think about this, this was written to a particular church at a particular time. 
So when Paul uses words like we and us and you, we have to first find out who that original audience was before we take it and apply it to ourselves. So he's saying here, upon whom, upon us, the end of the ages have come. Let me show you why that's uh, significant. We're going to go back to the Old Testament again, and then after this we're going to go make the point that I'm going to make for, uh, for today. To Micah chapter 7. All right? Micah chapter 7. Now you have Ezekiel, then Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. So Micah is right there towards the end of the Old Testament. Micah chapter 7. And I want to uh, read, you some pa- read to you some passages here. We're going to begin here in verse 12. All right? It'll be a day when they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt. Micah 7 verse 12. From Egypt to the Euphrates from sea to sea and mountain to mountain, and the earth will become desolate because of our inhabitants on account of the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your earth with your scepter, verse 14, the flock of your possession, which dwells by itself in the woodland in the midst of a fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, I will show you and the, the idea here is miracles. It might, your version might say uh, marvelous things. But these, these marvelous things that they're going to be shown are miracles. And so this is a time period of when the miraculous would be shown, when the sick would be healed, and when the uh, dead would, would rise, and when those who were with different affirmities would be relieved of them. All right, so as in the days when you come out of the land of Egypt, I'll show you miracles. Now, Notice when this day would be. Look at verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over... Wait, passes over? That kind of sounds familiar, right? The Passover from the, from the Exodus. Who passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea... You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our fathers from the days of old. So this is the time, again, when this time of the second exodus would take place. It would be a time marked by miraculous manifestations, but it would also be a time uh, marked by uh, the taking away of sin, the casting of iniquities to the sea, but also the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. He would fulfill those things that he promised Abraham in the days of old, the things that he promised to Jacob, that is, uh, to Israel. Now, how long did it take for the exodus to take place? It was 40 years, a generation's time. 40 years from the time they left Egypt to the time they entered the Promised Land. This theme of a generation is continued in the New Testament, right? Those miraculous manifestations lasted for 40 years. We know, we've discussed this before, though, but from the time of the, uh, from the, time of the ascension of Christ... To the time of the fall of Jerusalem, these miraculous gifts were manifested. And we're not going to get into the, the, the details of that, but I'm just showing you the correlation between this text and what you see in the New Testament. The point being is that this theme of this second exodus is one that's found throughout Scripture. So next time you see when you're reading uh, where it says in the Bible that uh, you know this is how it was in the Old Testament, or this is what Isaiah says, or this is what the prophet says, go back and read that context and most likely, it's going to be in a context of the restoration of Israel and the second exodus and the time of the new exodus. And so that's, that's really something that you're going to appreciate as you start reading your Bible. In fact, you'll remember, um, and I didn't put this verse into, into the lesson, but uh, you'll remember whenever John the Baptist sent people to ask Jesus, are you he you know, who I've uh, been going, you know, who I've been sent to, to proceed? And what did he tell them? He says that the dead, the dead are rising, the, you know, the sick are being healed, the deaf hear and the blind see. He was quoting a passage from Isaiah, a passage that is, fits within that New Exodus context. He's confirming that he is the one that, that, um, uh, that John sent, not just because he could do miracles, but because he was fulfilling specific prophecies in the Old Testament concerning his miraculous ministry. But we're going to go to the New Testament now, to Matthew chapter 2. And I'm going to read to you a passage that is, um, 
It's often misused because it's not taken within the context of this new Exodus theme. Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to read between, between uh, verse 16 and verse 18. Matthew 2, verses 16 to 18. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity. By the way, does that sound familiar? Is that not what happened in the time of the Exodus? Or in the time of Egypt? Okay. Uh, From two years old and under, according to the time when he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Now, a lot of people take this to mean that the, this passage by Jeremiah is talking about these people weeping because they're sad at what Herod has done to these young, young children two years old and younger. And that may be an application of it. But the question is, why were they weeping? It wasn't just because this purge had taken place, but it's because they had great expectations that the Messiah had been born at this time. That the, uh, you know, the, here's the shepherds and here's these wise men that are talking about these things. Not only that, but you have those in the temple that saw Jesus, that were expecting the kingdom of God to appear. They're expecting for it to be time for the restoration of Israel. They were ready for this new exodus. They just knew that somebody was going to save them from the Romans. And so let's go look at the Old, at the Old Testament where Jeremiah said this. Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. Jeremiah 31 verse 15. They're reaping here not just because they're reaping here not just because they're upset about what's happened to the uh, to the young men here, but they're weeping because they think that all hope has been lost for their promised restoration. That Herod has somehow stopped this. Because after all that's what he was trying to do. Look at Jeremiah chapter uh, 31 and begin here in verse 15. Thus says the Lord A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. But who's Rachel's children? Rachel's children was the Israelites as a whole, right? That's who, you know, that's that's who the uh, twelve tribes come through. All right. So Rachel's children are no more. They're thinking that their restoration hope is gone. They're not just sad because of what Herod has done. They're sad more of on a national scale in terms of their future. So here's what he says in verse 16. This is the Lord's response. Restrain your voice from weeping and your your eyes from tears. For your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their own territory. So God's answer is, don't cry. Don't cry. You are going to be restored. In other words, the Messiah was spared during this purge in Matthew chapter 2. See, a lot of people just read that and say, okay, Jeremiah is just applying this phrase. I mean, or rather, Matthew is just applying this verse from Jeremiah in just more of a cutesy way. But he's, he's, what he's doing is he is continuing with this theme of this second exodus, of this new exodus, and showing that despite man's intentions, God would still fulfill his promises to the people. Now, a lot of people, again, interp- interpret these uh, passages in a literal way, as if this is talking about a, uh, a physical restoration to the city of Jerusalem. But as we learned in the New Testament, and as we talked about and in that in Bible class, this was not something that they could reach out and touch, as Hebrews 12 tells us. It's not something that they would hear with their ears, but it's a spiritual thing taking place in Christ, restoration of people to God by means of Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. By the way, while you're in Jeremiah 31, in verse 15 and 16, notice what the, notice what the context of this passage is. Look at verse, uh, verse 27, but particularly verse 31, to see what the context of this is. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See that passage about the voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and weeping? is in the context of the establishment of the New Covenant. Now that establishment of the New Covenant is definitely parallel to the Exodus, is it not? 
when God established the Old Covenant. But notice what he says. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, and today I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This would be a covenant that wouldn't be like the covenant that they had when they came out of Egypt. When they came out of Egypt, that covenant, you're going to get a physical land with physical uh, blessings in that land. You're going to have physical generations going on and on and on you know, from your physical seed. But this is a spiritual idea in Jeremiah chapter 30 and following. It's a better covenant with a better priesthood. That is not one based on your physical lineage, but based on the fact that you're a child of God through faith, not because you have the right mom and dad. All right? Now, we got all this, and we're going to go back to the place where we started and, uh, and in Isaiah, and, but we're going to go this time to Isaiah 2 and, and bring this all together. All right, Isaiah chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 4. So here's the picture. Israel's been cut off from God. Judah's been cut off from God as well. They never are restored to the glory that they once had, but it's promised that they would be restored to that glory when their, when their iniquity is cast out under this David figure. In the New Testament, we see that John the Baptist initiates this beginning of this new exodus, saying that it's about to take place. Here we go. We're getting it ready. And then Jesus comes and confirms that he would be the one to, uh, to carry that mission on. And that's talked about uh, throughout, throughout the New Testament. But we will also learn that this would take place at a time of the giving of the new covenant. And it would also be at a time whenever men would attempt to, to thwart the plans of God, but God would not allow that to take place, and they still had hope despite man's interference. Here, and then we learn that this new covenant, it would not be like the covenant that was made in the days of Moses. And here's where Isaiah 2, 1 through 4 comes in. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about in the last days, last days of who, by the way, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains. And it will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, so he may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, will render decisions for many people. And here's the part I wanted to focus on. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and they will never again learn war. Now think about the difference between this and what happened in the first exodus. The first exodus, they were encouraged to pick up their swords, to pick up their spears, because God is going to go before them, and they're going to conquer the lands. But this covenant that God makes, this new covenant that restores Israel and gets everybody back to where they need to be, is not one where you lift up a sword or you lift up a spear. It's not one where you have to go out and fight a physical battle. But it's a a spiritual covenant. It's not one about physical land, but it's one about spiritual land. That is, being in Christ and and, uh, getting to go on and continue to be with Christ in heaven. This is why Paul said in his letters and, and how Jesus even encouraged his apostles, you know, this isn't a physical warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal. They're not after the flesh. I don't pick up a sword, physical sword, to teach somebody the gospel, but we pick up the spiritual sword of God's word, right? And even Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That was so different from what the Jews expected it, how they expected it to be filled, but that's the way that God intended it. They said, our kingdom is of this world, but Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world indicating that the fulfillment of these prophecies that we've read don't have to do with physical restoration of a nation and things such as that, but instead have to do, or even world domination of, uh, among the kingdom of God, but instead have to do with the spiritual domination of the kingdom of God and the, superior, the superiority of it in that regard. And so the point being is that you see how this Exodus theme that is throughout the New Testament really helps us to understand some of these passages that might previously have been overlooked or misleading to us. 
And when you read those passages that I gave you from Romans to read, when you go to those contexts, it's going to be New Exodus context. You're going to see that. And, and when you read all these other passages that are quoted in the New Testament, you're going to see uh, that New Exodus context and idea as well. And I think it's going to be beneficial to you. And so uh, what I wanted to do with this lesson then is to, is to try to teach us how to think like a first century Hebrew the best that we can. Because that's who wrote the Bible. Hebrews wrote to Hebrews. And those Greeks that came into the church, uh, they didn't change the gospel to match the Greeks' culture. They instead taught the Greeks the Hebrew culture so that they too could appreciate the gospel message. People think that Paul preached a different message than Jesus because Paul preached to Gentiles and Jesus preached to Jews. And so Paul changed the gospel. But when you go and you read his, his, his uh, books of the Bible, he talks about the same stuff that Jesus talked about pulled from the same passages and kept in that same theme of this new exodus. Not out of physical bondage, but out of spiritual bondage and out of the dominion of sin. He especially focuses on that in his book of Romans. I'll leave you with this final point of how the new exodus can help shape how you uh, read and interpret certain passages. In the book of Romans, in chapter, in chapter 4, it's about God and his promises to Abraham. In chapter 5, Paul takes a step back and sees how the sins of Adam has affected uh, the course of human history in a sense. In chapter 6, he discusses baptism and their passing through the Red Sea. In chapter 7, it's about the giving of the law and the effects of the law. And in chapter 8, they're marching into the promised land. So even Paul, in his book of Romans, follows a uh, new Exodus theme, so to speak. And he, he does that through many of his letters. He follows that same theme. And if we pick up on it, we'll have, we'll have a, a lot better understanding of the New Testament. Uh, speaking of this spiritual exodus, we all have our own personal journey that we go through in our lives where we come out of the dominion of sin and we go into the kingdom of God. And this is the experience of our conversion when we become Christians and followers of Christ. One of the other differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is the Old Covenant was, had, had become for them a works-based covenant. Even though they were still justified by faith, they still put their emphasis on works and even created the law to be somewhat of an idol to some of them, and to an extent. That's how they treated uh, the works of the law sometimes, as if it was an idol. Uh, you can read especially about the Pharisees lifting up their own ability to follow it over the main point, which was trusting in God. Nevertheless, though... Uh, the New Covenant differs from the Old Covenant in that way as well. While under the Old Covenant, it demanded perfection, uh, the New Covenant demands perfection in a different way. And that way is, is that we share in Jesus' Jesus's perfection through partaking in our death, burial, and resurrection with Him, through being obedient to His gospel. And we know uh, how that's done through, of course, trusting and putting all of our faith in Him and allowing that faith to bring about change in our life, and we know the importance of baptism as well in representing, in representing Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, as you can read about in multiple passages in God's Word, particularly uh, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Um, that being said, if there's anybody here that would like to be uh, baptized for the mission of their sins, or maybe it's the case that you were at some point, but kind of like those Israelites on their way out of Egypt, you might have slipped back and said, well, we'd rather go back and be with, with the Egyptians instead of be with old Moses. Well, if you've done that in your life as well, you have an opportunity uh, to, to ask for prayers for that too. Does anybody here need to make their life right with God in any way or have any prayer requests along those lines? All right, in that case, uh, we thank you so much for being here today. We hope that, uh, that the Bible class lesson and the worship lesson was beneficial to you in some way, even if it was minor. We're glad that it helped in some way. If you learned that you were wrong, that you were right and I was wrong, then I'm glad it helped you in that way too. <laughs> if you've been right this whole time and I just confirmed it for you and I'm just a wrong teacher, then good on you for figuring that out and I'm glad I was able to help in that way. I hope you just share with me what I was wrong about so I can get it straight. <laughs> uh, but we're also glad that we got Jaden and Cherish that can work those buttons for us. Uh, and if you go to christiansinarcadia.org, you can go listen to the lesson again today or one of the lessons from the past few weeks. And they show up. It takes them a while to show up there sometimes, but they show up there. And they